This is an excerpt from The Life of Michelangelo by John Addington Simons, the purpose of which is to present two sonnets by Michelangelo as translated by Simons. His discussion of Michelangelo's versification is itself of interest, and so I will begin with a rather lengthy preface. The thoughts and images out of which Michelangelo's poetry is woven are characteristically abstract and arid. He borrows no illustrations from external nature. The beauty of the world and all that lives in it might have been non-existent so far as he was concerned. Nor do his octave stanzas in praise of rural life form an exception to this statement. For these are imitated from Poliziano so far as they attempt pictures of the country, and their chief poetical feature is the mask of vices belonging to human nature in the city. His stock in trade consists of a few Platonic notions and a few Petrarchan antitheses. In the very large number of compositions which are devoted to love, this one idea predominates, that physical beauty is a direct beam sent from the eternal source of all reality in order to elevate the lover's soul and lead him on the upward path toward heaven. Carnal passion he regards with the aversion of an ascetic. It is impossible to say for certain to whom these mystical love poems were addressed. Whether a man or a woman is in the case, for both were probably the objects of his aesthetical admiration. The tone of feeling, the language, and the philosophy do not vary. He uses the same imagery, the same conceits, the same abstract ideas for both sexes, and adapts the leading motive which he had invented for a person of one sex to a person of the other when it suits his purpose. In our absolute incapacity to fix any amative connection upon Michelangelo, or to link his name with that of any contemporary beauty, we arrive at the conclusion strange as this may be, that the greater part of his love poetry is a scholastic exercise upon emotions transmuted into metaphysical and mystical conceptions. Only two pieces in the long series break this monotony by a touch of realism. They are divided by a period of more than thirty years. The first seems to date from an early epoch of his life. What joy hath yon glad wreath of flowers that is around her golden hair so deftly twined, each blossom pressing forward from behind as though to be the first her brows to kiss? The livelong day her dress hath perfect bliss that now reveals her breast, now seems to bind, and that fair woven net of gold refined rests on her cheek and throat in happiness. Yet still more blissful seems to me the band, gilt at the tips, so sweetly doth it ring, and clasp the bosom that it serves to lace. Yea, and the belt, to such as understand, bound round her waist, saith, Here I'd ever cling. What would my arms do in that girdle's place? The second can be ascribed with probability to the year 1534 or 1535. It is written upon the back of a rather singular letter addressed to him by a certain Pierre Antonio when both men were in Rome together. Kind to the world, but to itself unkind, a worm is born that, dying noiselessly, despoils itself to clothe fair limbs, 
and be in its true worth alone by death divined. Would I might die for my dear Lord to find raiment in my outworn mortality, that, changing like the snake, I might be free to cast the slough wherein I dwell confined. Nay, were it mine, that shaggy fleece that stays, woven and wrought into a vestment fair, around yon breast so beauteous in such bliss, all through the day thou'd have me, would I were the shoes that bear that burden. When the ways were wet with rain, thy feet I then would kiss.